So uh, my name is Tom. In case you did not know who I am, that's who I am. I'm Tom. And we are, we are in uh, 1 Samuel 25. And the, 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 it's, when you listen to 1 Samuel, sometimes it might be possible when you're reading um, these stories to, um, to not go slow enough and to take your time. Uh, God says some, such wonderful things fascinatingly through stories. So one guy, one guy said, why did God choose the Jews? Because he likes stories. And we get some just fabulous stories in the midst of this book. And in 1 Samuel 25, what, what we're picking up is uh, there, was this, there was this guy who was uh, the leader of Israel, and God decided he, his, he was not going to stay the leader, and so a new guy's chosen as leader, um, and the new guy, like, is killing it. I mean, literally, he's a warrior. He's killing it. Um, and he's, he's just su super successful, more su successful than the other guy, and he's anointed to be king. And I don't know if you know this, but sometimes kings or leaders don't want the next guy to become the leader. I mean, that can happen. Um, at least it happened back then. So it happened back then that he didn't, he didn't want that um, sort of thing. And so David, who is this guy who's going to be the new king, um, he... Um, well, he becomes an outlaw. He, the, the old king wants to kill the new king, and he becomes an outlaw. There's, I don't, I've been trying, racking my brain, because all, all I can think of is outlaws who deserve to be outlaws when I think of the West, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, imagine, imagine he's, like re, he's leading a group like 600, maybe a, I don't know how he'd come up with this, but imagine like an ethical gang leader. So like there's this gang of 600 people who do good, but they're outlaws. And we don't know why, but this is a crazy fiction. But that's what this guy is like. He's this guy, and he, descent, he learns of this other guy. And there are a couple puns to this story, which puns, do, I don't know if you know this, they never translate into another language. So we're going to meet this guy, Nabal. And Nabal's uh, word, Nabal, um, can really be can go several ways. And Nabal can mean fool in Hebrew. Um, I doubt anyone names their kid fool. Now, maybe we could probably find that in America. But I doubt anyone names their kid fool, probably named after, like, the harp, because a, a Neville is a harp. So maybe they've named him after a harp. But this, this wordplay can also mean a wineskin or like a, what we would call a wine bottle today. Could be a carcass um, and could be fool and can be a proper name, Nabal. So that... That's going to get worked into the story. You may not pick all that up. And one other potential pun is there. We'll find him that he's a Calebite. Well, a Caleb is a dog. And when you re read about Nabal, you'll go, this guy's not really impressive. So I, I, wanna, I want to invite you to listen to what God might be saying um, in, in the, what God is saying in 1 Samuel 25. There was a man in my own whose property was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and his wife uh, was Abigail. The woman was clever and beautiful, but the man was surly and mean. He was a Calebite. David heard that in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to them, Go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. Thus you shall salute him. Peace be with you. Peace be to your house and peace be to all that you have. I've heard that you're shearing, and now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they've missed nothing. All the time they were uh, with us in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you, therefore let my young men find favor in your sight, for we've come on a feast day. For we have come, and uh, please give whatever you have at the hand of, to your servants and to your son David. But when David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal, in the name of David, and they, they waited. And Nabal answered David's servant, saying, Who's David? Who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants today that are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and the meat that I butchered for my shears and give it to men who have come from where I do not know? Do I not? Why? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. So every one of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up with David, while 200 remained with the baggage. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, we uh, thank you that you are God. 
And God, you know so many things get in the way of us being able to hear you. So we pray that your spirit would open our eyes, that we might see wonderful things out of your word. That you would meet each of us, that you would touch uh, places that need to be touched in all of us, and we would hear you. And we would not merely listen, but we would respond, that you would work transformation in us. We thank you that you are God. We thank you that you are good. And we pray that you would be glorified. Amen. That's an interesting exchange, right? So here's this guy who's the leader of, well, we learned 600 men. And somehow this guy, this other guy, Nabal, has 3,000 sheep. Now, I've been told, I don't know this from experience, that one little lamb puts out two pounds of wool. So that's three tons of sheep. You're going to keep a lot of people warm with all that wool. This is a rich man. But apparently back in there, that day, there could be really rich people who were foolish, um, who weren't wise. People who had lots of wealth but were idiots. Um, and that happened back in those days. It was an amazing thing. And so, um, and so Nabal just kind of doesn't grasp the situation. I would say his situational awareness or his street smarts might be another way of talking about, but they didn't have streets. So the street smarts back in those days were, were just like clueless. Like, okay, this guy, this guy's been around. He's, he's, a, he's a warrior. All the guys with him are warriors. And he's been taking care of your guys. And nothing's lost to you. You might show a little gratitude. I mean, if you got 3,000 sheep, what, you send five? I mean, how, what's that going to cost you? Really? But instead, the guy's just surly and mean, as we're told up front. And he just responds in an amazing way. What Nabal lacks is wisdom. I look at wisdom as not an on-off binary category. I see wisdom as a continuum. And it's, it's something I've, I'm hoping that I keep moving up in terms of gradient. Uh, we'll see. Uh, there are times I display amazing foolishness. And hopefully, by God's grace, I, I show some wisdom from time to time. In the book of Proverbs, if you ever want to learn wisdom, book of Proverbs is a great place to go. And it'll say some pretty simple things like uh, Proverbs 4, 7. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. <laughs> and whatever else you get, get insight. Now, I mean, once as you look at this, you go, what is this saying? And, and here's where Mark Twain's dictum would be a good one. The problem with common sense is it's not that common. Right? I mean, admit it. I'm assuming for you, since we're all human beings, there are times when you are not wise. And we might use the term, yeah, I'm an idiot, right? We, you know, we're just foolish, might be another way to talk about it. And Proverbs reiterates it. He sa they say, uh, buy truth and do not sell it, Proverbs 23, 23. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. You know, to be rich is not to be wise. Uh, to, to be old is not to be wise. My guess is you can think of people who are old, and they're not wise. Uh, it's a continued practice. Uh, you may be wise now. That's no guarantee you will be wise later. It's a, it's a practice. It's a lived art. It's a way of going. Get wisdom, says God to us. Get wisdom. David's reaction is fascinating to me. The guy doesn't send him any food, and he's like, everyone strap on a sword. So 400 guys strap on their swords, right? So this outlaw is kind of going to live up the name outlaw, unfortunately, at this moment. And I remember I, I meet with, uh, I, I coach and consult with people from time to time. I was meeting with this one guy, and he was telling me about his marriage. And he said, I'm, you know, it's really hard. I said, well, what's hard about it? Well, sometimes my wife doesn't respect me. I said to him, do you need your wife to respect you to be a good husband? Do you? Is that essential to being a good husband, that your wife must always respect you? I don't, I don't see how that works. So your behavior is dependent upon your wife's behavior? I need you to change so I can feel happy? What's wisdom? How do you want to show up? How do you want to be in life? What sort of person do you want to be, and how is that defined? Get wisdom. Get wisdom, whatever you can do, buy insight, buy it. By truth, don't sell it. By wisdom, by instruction, by understanding. David's reacting. 
You know, there, it's, we have these amazing, I don't know about you, but I assume just because you're a human being, we have these places that get touched in us that there is, there is just, a, it's so fast is our reaction to it. I'm, I've tried to get better at paying attention to the way I just snap, the way I just quickly respond, because I'm, I'm trying to slow that down. I'm trying to go from one millisecond to two milliseconds. That's a win, by the way. If you can go from one millisecond to two milliseconds, even though you might snap, you still had a win. And maybe you can get to three milliseconds. So um, we're going to pick up at, at 14. One of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, and David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, yet he shouted insults at them. So apparently a bit more than what we've heard. Yet the men were very good to us. We suffered no harm. We never missed anything when we were in the fields as long as we were with them. They were a wall to us both by day and by night, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know this and consider what you should do, for evil has been decided against our master, against all of his house. He's so ill-natured that no one can speak to him. Wow. I love this servant. Notice just the gentleness that he says. He's one, he goes and tells his mistress, right, the master, the woman master of the house, what, what's going on. I mean, that's, if you know something's wrong and you're not telling anyone, that's not good. But this guy sees a problem and goes, and, but doesn't tell her what to do. Hey, uh, this is bad. And from what I could see, it's, it's going to get really bad. And you might want to figure out what you want to do with this. I don't think we always need to tell people how they should live their lives. I think sometimes we could say to the, offer them some truth and then figure out that they're adults, assuming they're adults, that we could ask them that. We could say, hey, you know, this is what I see. I, I have a friend who watched another friend um, slowly but surely get closer to a woman that wasn't his wife. And he spoke to his friend. He said, ah, I'm a little uncomfortable what I'm seeing, just kind of the way you're interacting. And, of course, the friend kind of blew him off. Ah, it's fine. It's not, nothing going on. Nothing going on. Nothing going on. Well, unfortunately, what the guy saw was right. It was true. And the guy did end up having an affair in his wife. I can't control the outcome of when I speak some truth into someone's life, but it's still worth speaking truth into someone's life. Because sometimes people are able to hear that. Because I have another friend who heard it and just stopped bad behavior. Uh, and it was not even bad, it really. It was just kind of shadowy, moving towards something. What, what does it take for you to listen? What does it take for you to listen, to have open ears? When someone is speaking truth into your life to be teachable. Again, I, I see that as kind of an ebb and flowing thing. It's not like one day I become teachable and I'm always teachable for the rest of my life. It's like I have days where I'm more teachable than other days. How do I keep moving the the thing up the graph? How do I keep improving that sort of thing? Abigail's response to the servant's fascinating. Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, Neville's, by the way, five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs. She loaded them onto donkeys and said to her young men, go on ahead of me, I'm coming after you but she did not tell her husband Nabal. And she rode on the donkey and came down under the cover of the mountain. David and his men came down towards her, and she met them. Hey, a person defines themselves not by what they say, but what they do. A person defines themselves not by what they say, but what they do. Um, the danger for my wife is she's married to a preacher. I'm married to a preacher, it's not a danger for me. But the danger for my wife is she's married to a preacher. And so the danger for my wife is it's just this, right? Oh, yeah, sure, honey, yep, yeah, I'll do that. Yep, 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 I'll do that, I'll do that. Those are words. Those are just, that's words. A person defines themselves by what they do. Abigail's defining herself real fast. This is resource, this is action, this is energy. She, her situational awareness is phenomenal. Oh, you know, certainly David's men and David might be hangry, but I think it's more than that. But she understands a way to address this, right? Food. These guys, they need provision. 
and she does something about it. And she's wise enough to even send people ahead of her because that's not going to be a fast trek on donkeys carrying all that sort of stuff. Abigail's wisdom is stunning to me. I, I like it. Uh, here are two things from Proverbs. And it's a contrast between Abigail and, and Nabal. And from Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. What does it take for your words to become softer? How, how do you diminish the harshness of your words? I, it's been a project I've been working on. How do I change that? One, my wife said to me one day, we were, had two, two of our grandchildren, and she said, that was a little intense. The, the, the kids were doing something I wasn't crazy about, and I, I looked at her and went, yeah. It, kids weren't injured. It was fine. It's just not the way I want to show up as a grandpa. It's like, no, nah, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to be that way. Right? A soft answer turns away rash, wrath, but a harsh wood stirs up anger. And here's Abigail, Proverbs 15, 28. The mind of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil. What does it take to slow down your response rate to figure out what should be coming out of your mouth to get thoughtful for that? Well, we learned something about David that was kept from us. Um, in 21, now David had said, surely it was in vain that I protected all that this fellow had in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all belonging to him, and he's returned me evil for good. God do so to David and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male who belong to him. Um, I'm looking around, I don't see any, there's no one who's like young in this room, right? So the King James Version, I'm now quoting the King James Version. This, was their, this is how they translate correctly uh, the, the term for man, he that pisseth against the wall. I will destroy everyone who pisseth against the wall. That's a vivid translation. It's in <laughs> King's English, so I figure I'm okay saying this out loud, but to you who are listening to the recording, good luck. <laughs> right? So, but I mean, that's an angry man, right? I mean, that's a guy who's making it really clear what he's going to do and not going, this is what I'm going to do. And that's, a, by the way, a correct translation. What's funny is he invokes God in this. Really? You're invoking, may God do so to me. Is this really a good sort of pledge to make to God at this point? Is this a time to swear by the Lord that you're going to do something? Eh, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. So, Abigail. Abigail sees David, and she hurries and alights from her donkey. I like that, alight. She jumps down from the donkey. And she fell before David on her face. Watch, watch the wiseness of her rhetoric. Bowing to the ground, she fell at his feet and said, Upon me alone, my lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. My lord, do not take seriously this ill-natured fellow Nabal, that is his name, and so he is. Nabal, fool, is his name. And folly is with him, but I, your servant, uh, did not see the young men whom you sent. Uh, from Proverbs 16.23, the mind of one who's wise makes their speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to their lips. How can, how can you work the words on your mouth? It would be judicious and kind. She understands what's going on. She understands there's this guy all suited up. And she, she is the right person at the right time, right? No other person really could do this. One of Nabal's lads could not come and do this. Nabal's wife can come and do this. And however we might want to look at this in our culture, it would be a misunderstanding and not to see what happened there. She's smart to get on her face. She's smart to just, on me, is all on me. And we all know it's not on her. I think David even knows it's not on her. But she has enough wisdom to just go, no, don't, don't think of it at all, right? What is she doing? She's not merely protecting herself. She's protecting the household. Everyone who works in that household. All this is on me. It's, it's, on, it's on me, my Lord. David's full of rage. Everyone's carrying a sword. And, and what she is full of, is wisdom. There's a story uh, that's told about uh, Winston Churchill's wife. Winston Churchill has just become prime minister. It's the early days of the war, and he is just becoming rude. Um, he's uh, just become terrible, sarcastic, overbearing, with his inner circle of leaders. 
I mean, that's not the guy to become overbearing and sarcastic with during a war. And so Clementine writes this letter to her husband. My darling Winston, she began in a letter, I must confess that I've noticed a deterioration in your manner, and you're not so kind as you used to be. She cautioned that in possessing the power to give orders and sack anyone and everyone, that he was obliged to maintain a high standard of behavior, to combine kindness and, if possible, Olympic calm. I like that phrase, Olympic calm. She reminded him in the past that he was fond of quoting a French maxim um, that essentially means one leads by calm. One leads by calm. What does it mean to be a thermostat instead of a thermometer? She continued, I cannot bear that those who serve the country and yourself should not love you as well and admire you and respect you. But she warned, you won't get the best results with irascibility and rudeness. It will either breed dislike or a slave mentality. She closed the letter with these words, please forgive your loving, devoted, and watchful Clementine. She understands rhetoric, too, and understands the relationship. And Winston, from that point on, changed his whole demeanor, the way he was. Sometimes you are the right person in the right time to speak truth into someone's life. Sometimes you have the ability to go, hey, like one time, I'm going to tell a really bad story, so allow this small good story about me. One time I'm sitting at a restaurant, and I'm with, with some friends that I was working with, wonderful Christian uh, folk, and I'm watching one of my friends just be a toad to the waitress. I mean, he's just so rude, and I'm just watching him going. It's out of, it's not normal, Tim. I'm watching him. Like, the third time she leaves, I look at him and go, hey, man, you okay? He goes, yeah, why? You are being a toad to the waitress. He said, I am? Oh, you are awful. Really? Yep. Terrible. There are times that you have the ability to sit with someone who you love and they know you love, and you can speak truth. Love gives one the ability to speak truth into people's lives. And you might have that moment in time to just say that. Say it. That's what Abigail is doing. She, in, in her wisdom, is saying some very important words. She goes on now, up to this point in this story, for me, it's the only time God has appeared is in a terrible oath. God do so to me and more. That's a terrible time to invoke God's name. But Abigail takes us from what would seem just like a human-to-human -human encounter and then helps us to understand that there's something more to it. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, since the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and taking vengeance with your own hand. Still rhetoric, but true. Now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be like Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought you to my Lord, given to your young men who follow my Lord, Please forgive the trespasses of your servant, talking about herself, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If anyone should rise up and pursue you to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living under the care of the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies he shall sling out from the hollow of a sling. When the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause for grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or having saved himself. When the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Abigail's moved it to what is always the case. When two people are having a conversation, God's always involved. We can't talk behind God's back. Did you know? Right? I mean, what does that even look like, to talk behind God's back? And Abigail is giving him a better warning than just don't do this, but look, God's a part of this. And your future leadership is, is in the sway here. It's in the balance here. I, uh, I was in the kitchen one day, and I'm talking, and Gail looks up at me, and she goes, I don't want to be talked to that way. And this is my honest reaction. I will not be talked to that way. And my reaction is honestly like, I was going go, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, um, 
This is not an excuse, it's an explanation. Here's what's going on inside of me. Here's what, what's, what's really rising up against me, but oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me. And, and I went back to my office and I pondered it for several hours. I had some other work I was doing, but just to kind of intermittently go through, I'm like, how in the world was I so clueless that I was unaware that I was being a jerk? What, what, was, what was it that I couldn't even see that I'm shocked by when she's telling me that, that I'm being rude to her? How is that possible? It's very possible. But how, what's going on inside of me that I am clueless to this interaction? And so I just, I really wanted to pay attention. I wanted to get a grasp. I came back later and I just sat down with her and I said, you know, I, I, I want to thank you again for telling me that. Um, I honestly had no idea. And that's terrible all by itself. I had no idea I was being rude to you. Thank you for telling me. And, and again, not, not an excuse in any way, just, just so you know what's going on inside of me, what, what the stress is inside of me, but in no way excusing what, I, what was going on. But thank you for telling me. I'm so glad you told me. What does it take for you to even notice what's going on with you? What does that take? How can you become self-aware? Again, I think that's a continuum. I think it's something we're just kind of slowly moving on a graph to get, to get better at. David, at this point, is able to get it. And he says to her, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you to meet me today. David gets this is more than two people having a conversation. Blessed be your good sense, and blessed be you who have kept me today from blood guilt and avenging myself with my own hand, for as surely as the Lord of God, the God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me. Truly by morning there would be not left to Nabal even more than one male. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have heeded your voice. I've granted your petition. Just because someone can listen to a moment of truth does, is not a guarantee that David will be able to catch that for the rest of his life. If you read the rest of his life, he'll have moments where he'll grandly disappoint you. And there are moments where he's really able to hear the truth. And that's David. What about you? What about me? What does it take for you to become self-aware that you can see, oh, wow, I was really fast there. That was terrible. Or, oh, wow, I want to be fast here. i got to slow this down. And what does it take for you to be able to listen to someone speak harsh, good truth into your life? Hey, man, what's up with you with, with a waitress? What does it take for you to hear truth spoken into you? The book of Proverbs seems largely a secular book, but embedded in it are some really important phrases to listen to. And one is from Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. I'm comfortable with the fear of the Lord actually being fear. That, that's one level of it. There are certain things I don't do because I honestly fear God. I wish there were more things I didn't do because I honestly fear God. But there are some things I don't do because I fear God. But I also think the fear of God means respect and, and adoration of like, if I fear God, why would I fear anyone else? Seriously. If you genuinely fear God deep within your bones, what else is there to fear? Because God is worth that. And the fear of God keeps us from strapping on our swords, which most of us, most of us do with our mouths, right? Strapping on our swords and start riding to get vengeance because we weren't respected. The fear of God reminds us that all of us are created in the image of God. There is no upper and lower tier of humanity. There's one tier and everyone's an elevated tier because we're all made in the image of God, which is a striking, striking thing. And David on this day has the grace to go, oh my God, it's God. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. How's that happen for you? I think it takes intentionality because that's what it takes for me. For me, it takes waking up in the morning, spending some time with God, and then paying attention to my life. I'm like, how do I want to show up today? How does it take? It takes humility. See, being made in the image of God means I'm not, I don't get to take his place. And, and you've heard me tell you stories, and I'll be glad to tell you more. 
just I'm kind of like this up and down, trying to move towards the higher end of the graph, but I'm on this process, probably you too. And so here's the great news. The great news is Christians, for those of us who are known by Jesus as grace, he keeps forgiving us. It's strange. It's mysterious. Every day he says, yep, I love you. Yep, I can forgive that. Yep, that one too. Yep, 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 yep. Right? In some of our cases, we can't even hear the distinction between yeps because it's just this continual sound of yeps, right? <laughs> but that's who he is. And the next thing he does is when you became a Christian, he gives you this gift called the Holy Spirit. And you cry out for the Spirit and you say, I'm not doing well right now. Help me, Jesus. Pour your Spirit upon me. Work through someone like me made of clay and dust. I, I want to step up in this game. My hope is before uh, Gail or I dies that she has a more mature husband at that time period. It's one of my goals. I hope to become a more adult. I think adulting, as you've heard me say before, is a pejorative rendered on 20-year-olds, on but it's true of anyone of any decade. We're adulting for the rest of our lives. As a, tell me you don't know a 70-year-old who's a child. I do, right? May God be so gracious to all of us that we might continue to move up and respond to the one who loves us, the woman who lived, who died, who's risen for us, who right now is ascended, sits on the right hand of God, is our priest who intercedes for you and me. You're not alone. You're never alone. You cannot talk behind the back of God. He is present to you now. He adores you because he's not like us, continually loves you. Would you pray with me?